Hey everyone, my name is Tegan, welcome back to Tandy Rights and it's been a very long time since I've made any kind of video because uni's ruined my life. So, I wanted to make this one and I specifically wanted to write the review for it because this book has taken over every single thought I have. So this review has some spoilers for the ending of the book and it's also got a couple mentions of scenes throughout the book which maybe aren't necessarily spoilers but they might give away a few things if you'd like to go in mostly blind. I need to tell you what book this is. This book is House of Salt and Sorrows by Erin A. Craig. This, I think, is her debut. It came out maybe 2019, I think. I don't know this. But I picked up this book because I'm going through a very intense, like, lighthouse core, um, kind of like gothic -y ocean sea monster phase in both my reading and writing and my general aesthetic, my online persona, some may say. So I saw this cover while I was scrolling through my libraries like ebooks app and I had a little read of the description and I just knew straight away that this was the book for me. This was the capital letter T the book. And I didn't know it was a Twelve Dancing Princesses some I what's the I don't know the actual title of the story but Twelve Dancing Princesses. I didn't know it was a retelling for that. And so I read a couple of the reviews so I can't really like fully weigh in on the accomplishments of this book as a retelling but I did read like the Wikipedia summary just to have an idea of what was going on and when I found out it was a retelling I start to have my doubts like expecting this to be a very typical YA fairy tale retelling like evil stepmother and all but fortunately this book was very far from typical so Annalie is one of the eight remaining Thomas sisters they're originally the Thomas Dozen they are the 12 dancing princesses and their families believed to be cursed because the eldest four of them died in what was originally believed to be like very tragic accidents. However, Annalie, our main protagonist and narrator, she's very haunted by these unexplained deaths and, and the most recent death, the circumstances around it made her believe that maybe, maybe her sisters were murdered. So she's gone into investigating, are these murders or is the family truly cursed? I think the thing I love most about this book is just the atmosphere of it. I haven't read a book with this such strong visual surrounding since when I read, when I read, when I read Hold Back the Tide and the setting and the atmosphere of that was also a very strong point. So this book has this like dark and now haunted manner which is somehow full of life because there's all these kids and people and parties there and it's in contrast with um, these balls, these very spectacular glitzy parties that the sisters sneak out to go to yet they are somehow full of like darkness and nightmares so I like the contrast between the actual location and the mood and then in contrast to these other places because it very encapsul encapsulates this beauty of light and dark and like the dreams and nightmares and it all plays out and unravels throughout this book. The island setting is like very super dark and eerie and I love how the first chapter really captures the mood and the key plot elements. The opening scene is literally at the sister's funeral and it introduces obviously the funerals, the, a god and the curse which are, it really establishes all of this right off the bat. And it also introduces a lighthouse which exists for more than just the aesthetic and I'm just magnificent, magnificent. This is all I wanted in a book. If you have more recommendations about books involving lighthouses, let me know because I'm still in this phase. And also not just about the settings and the atmosphere, the writing itself is so lyrical and flowy and beautiful that it really felt in a lot of the times that I was just engrossed in the movie, like I could really see what was going on. And the realness of this writing made these handful of really absurd scenes a lot more believable. Even though the story isn't exactly a horror novel, I think a lot of people have tagged it as that because it does have a lot of these very classic horror elements so I don't want to deprive it of that genre. And I definitely felt these original grim influences, especially more in the second half of the book, and there was this big rise of like stomach churning, nightmare worthy scenes of these visions and hauntings and bad dreams. And there's one scene that stuck out to me the most part of this book. It isn't 
a particularly horrifying or gory scene in the book. It's someone that has a very simplistically eerie atmosphere that I just couldn't stop thinking about it when I put the book, well, my phone down. And that scene was, there's one where Anneli is literally just walking around the house one night. I don't remember the context of it fully right now, but she's going around and she's realizing that the balls weren't real. And she just sees her sisters like dancing around the room alone with like these glazed over eyes. And reading that, even though it isn't particularly glory or explicit in horror, there's something just so off-putting about it that really stands out. I want to keep this short so I'm going to say that I'd probably write this right, I'd probably rate this book more as like a 4.5 rather than the full 5 stars I gave on Goodreads. It's so like a 9 out of 10, so close to perfection, but it might as well be there. The lost half star is due to the romance or a specific character who ends up being evolved, involved in the romance. I can't quite place if it's him or the romance, that's the issue for me. It's the character, if you read this you'll know, if not, skip to the end, this is, this is big spoiler time. The character is Cassius and he's a descendant or like a relation to the gods or the religion. And that's something that came into play in the final few chapters of the book. And for me, I felt like this concept just came out of nowhere. Like his character was quite mysterious throughout the entire story, but it was a, just, it wasn't a mystery that made me think, oh yeah, he's a god. It was a mystery of like, oh, there's this mysterious guy. No one knows where he came from kind of thing, you know? Like the whole mysterious, tall, dark, handsome stranger comes out of nowhere. Not that he's a god. And him being related to a god seems, when you're reading it, seems like such a key plot element, but it felt like it came out of nowhere and also adding this in to the ending of the book really overcomplicated it for me. Like, I feel like the ending could have been equally as good if he just straight up didn't exist. <laughs> that sounds bad. However, I did like that his character was genuinely a part of the story for a majority of the book and he wasn't just a forced put in their love interest who just appeared every now and then. And that the romance wasn't entirely consuming, it had its moments. It had a epilogue that very strongly reminded me of my favourite scene from Song of Achilles, which I don't know where it is in here anymore, I've moved my shelves around. But the ending gave me a little tears because even though I didn't like the romance it reminded me so strongly of my favourite scene from Song of Achilles. But yeah, I think overall the romance itself, even though the character had been around for the majority of the book, the, the romance was a bit insta-love. came out of nowhere just a little bit. But ignoring that negativity, in summary, I think I want to read any retelling or just anything in general that Erin e. Craig writes. This was beautiful. One final kiss for the world. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to read this in written form and ignore my rambling, I'll put a link to the blog in the description. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time. Bye.